Let me start praying, and then we'll jump on in. God, thank you for your word where you you just provide truth for us. You give us perspective on things big and small. It's so sweet to spend time considering that which we do every day, every night, sleep from your perspective, putting it in perspective and in learning about you and your purposes as we consider sleep. God, I pray for myself that I would speak clearly. I pray that I would represent your word accurately. And for all who are here or may listen later, I do pray that they would benefit from this time, and most of all, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, over the last three weeks of of class, of this sessions, we have laid out the myriad benefits that God designed for us in sleep. Today's lesson on biblical theology of sleep has to be received atop the foundation that we built on the previous three weeks sessions. So if you if this is the first time you're hearing this, enjoy it, but please go back and listen to the previous three, because what we'll be sharing today is built on that foundation. I'm going to review that quickly. There was some points that we learned that about God's good purposes in his design for sleep. First, sleep should be a nightly reminder, a nightly humbling reminder that God is God and we are creatures. We need this reminder. We can't contemplate God too much. And we, we always live our lives, we must always live our lives with an awareness of God's otherness, his holiness. And so when we approach sleep with a mind informed by God's word and with a proper theology of sleep, the nightly practice of sleep will give you an opportunity to remember, meditate, and worship on God and particularly his incommunicable attributes. Sleep is a nightly demonstration of our need in God's incomparable faithfulness and strength. It's God who created us to sleep. He doesn't need to sleep and the world will keep running while we rest, but not if God does. And yet he sustains all things he created without fail, without need to sleep. Psalm 121.3 declares, he who keeps you will not slumber. Then we learned point three, that sleep is a nightly opportunity to humbly and dependently trust God. In a number of Psalms, King David demonstrates how sleep can be an expression of humble, dependent trust in God. Even when his life was under threat from his murderous son, Absalom, and his heart was in turmoil, King David was able to find sleep, probably sleep at the bottom of a pit, hiding because he trusted God. When he awoke, he prayed the words of Psalm 3, 5 through 6. I lay down and slept, and I awoke again, for Yahweh sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. And you might remember that Jesus, when we when it's account, recounted to us that he slept, he slept in the midst of a storm. Anxiety is a sin that often robs us of sleep, but humble, thankful, dependent trust in God cannot coexist with anxiety. Each night, you and I have an opportunity to express that humble dependency when we cast our cares on him and trust him while we sleep. And finally, last week, we spent the entire session three on the fourth point, that sleep is a gift from God whereby he works for his beloved while we rest. Sleep was given to us by God as a good gift intended to point us to him in faith and away from ourselves. So for God's beloved, for those who have faith in him that banishes self-dependence, Proverbs 3.24 promises If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet because it's a gift from God. So sleep is good. We need sleep. And we ought to order our life and our thinking to not view sleep as a necessary evil or an inconvenient interlude from what really matters. No, sleep is a good gift that we need. And we would do well to embrace this need and not cut it short. 
We physically function better when we get a full night's sleep. With acute sleep deprivation, our performance in pretty much all aspects of life will suffer. With chronic sleep deprivation, our lives will tend to be shorter, more disease riddled, and we will likely not be effective with the hours you are awake as we would be when we got sleep. That's a summary of what we covered in the previous three weeks. And even still, with this, in our bustling 24-hour world where we can flip a light switch and keep working and have instant access to all the world's news and problems in our pocket, we can check emails and get work done at any hour of the day or night, we often find ourselves waking up early and staying up late in neglect of this gift. I want to consider anxiety um, in relation to sleep. Do you ever find yourself staying awake, thinking about problems that only God can solve? Does worry about tomorrow and the problems Jesus said are for tomorrow rob you of the gift of sleep today? Anxiety is the futile thought, worry, or concern that's ultimately an expression of distrust in God's plan for you. The world will tell you that anxiety is a medical problem that needs to be fixed or drugged away. You might just think that it's as natural for you as breathing, but at its heart, anxiety is ultimately an expression of distrust in God's plan for you. It's a panicked, ner nervous, worrying demeanor that expresses a desire to take the situation into your own hands. And this is why the Bible presents anxiety as sin. It's the opposite of trust. At its core, anxiety doubts that God is either all-powerful or that he's all-good. Sleep, on the other hand, is an expression of trust in God's all-powerful goodness. This is why anxiety is often the source of sleeplessness. Consider the contrast between anxiety and sleep. Anxiety is a sinful doubt in God's wisdom, goodness, or power. Even if you don't recognize it, that's what it expresses. It is an implicit declaration that you would be a better God than God. What does sleep express? It's an opportunity for the Christian to express trust in God's goodness and power. And it's an implicit demonstration. Um, demonstration for the Christian ought to be an explicit declaration that God is God and we are not. For the anxious one, sleep is fleeting, and for the trusting one, sleep is sweet. And yet, there is a sleeplessness that some of you might experience at times that doesn't come from sin. It is true that Sin will often lead to sleeplessness. Anxiety is often a cause of sleeplessness. Don't assume that your sleeplessness is coming from something other than your heart. But at the same time, I, I, want, I want to acknowledge that there is a sleeplessness that doesn't come from sin. You can have a, a heart set on God in faith-filled trust and still find yourself unable to enjoy this gift of sleep in adequate doses. Noise, cold, pain, crying babies. Sometimes Solomon's description of sleep is sweet from Proverbs 3.24 feels completely foreign or unknown. Due to circumstances outside your control, maybe your, your night might sound more like or feel more like Job's words in Job 7.4. He said, when I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? But the night is long, and I'm full of tossings till the dawn. God's word isn't oblivious to these physical realities. It can be a normal part of life, even of the faithful, to experience seasons where sleep is desired and cannot be found. And so you find yourself in those seasons crying out to the Lord, in weary neediness. Sometimes, even for faithful ones, the words of the psalmist in Psalm 102 seem more relatable to, the, to you than those of David in Psalm 3 and 4. 
Psalm 102, verse 1 and 7 says, Hear my prayer, O Yahweh. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in my day of distress. He says, I lie awake like a lowly sparrow. Or maybe the plaintiff pleadings of Asaph in Psalm 77, 4, where in your weary sleeplessness you can feel like him, where it feels like God might even be against you. Asaph's weariness didn't find the rest of sleep in the night, and it felt like God himself was keeping him from sleep. He said, you keep my eyelids open, speaking of God, before he then preached truth to himself. Until we get our glorified bodies At that point, our groaning and pain that go along with life in this fallen world will finally be undone. But until then, sleeplessness will be a reality for many. As we've learned, sleeplessness may be the result of sin, right? Might be from anxiety, might be from anxious toilings, perhaps from laziness, not getting to bed on time. But it's just as true that sleeplessness itself doesn't always come from a sinful disposition of your heart. Think of things like pregnancy, parenthood, pain, Parkinson's, soldiers at war, loud neighbors, those without shelter in cold and heat, sickness, medications like chemotherapy and others, menopause, night shift work, jet lag from travel, daylight savings time, sometimes excitement for good things like the bride waiting up for her husband in Song of Solomon 5.2, or the Christmas Eve type excitement of Christmas morning gifts. We can come up with countless other ways where sleep is often difficult to find and oftentimes not associated with sin. Parents know the sleeplessness that comes with the arrival of a newborn. Similarly, those who are taking care of another, another, like a sick spouse, a loved one, even a stranger, early mornings and late nights because you're giving yourself to another and God glorifying selfless love is the opposite of the anxious toil warned against in Psalm 127. But it still comes with all of the physiologic hardships of lack of sleep. So addressing this situation of earnestly desiring sleep but being unable to find it has probably been the most requested topic to cover since I started this series. There's been many of you who've explained the difficulty of your situation. Hearing what I'm saying about God's good purposes in sleep, longing for it, and being unable to find it in many seasons of your life. So let's address that for a time here. And just, we have to start with recognizing that suffering, the falling apart of our bodies, pain, and maybe especially the helplessness and misery of sleeplessness are part of living in this fallen world. Part of the futility of living in and being part of a creation groaning for redemption. And for us who have been chosen, adopted, and redeemed, our groanings are pointing us towards something better to come the redemption of our broken bodies. For the Christian, our groanings and the suffering and futility of this life that often includes misery of sleepless nights point us beyond this life to the next as we wait eagerly for the fruit of our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Before the fall, there was sleep, but not the misery of sleeplessness. In heaven, there will likely be sleep, but we will be redeemed from this misery of sleeplessness. In the meantime, whether we sleep or lie awake, pleading with the Lord, we hope and we trust in the one who loves us and gave himself for us. Our loving Father knows what we need. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? 
This doesn't mean that he will give us all that we want, but in his perfect love and wisdom, he will give us all that we need and then some. Our loving father who gave us his son is not expressing stinginess, inability, or lovelessness when his children can't find sleep. God decisively proved his love for us and his commitment to his own at the cross. There will be nothing that is best for us that will be withheld. Nothing for which Christ died will be missing for his children. And when you or I are tempted to doubt God's love or to be weary in despair and suffering, whether it be sleeplessness or another source, we need to look at the cross where God's love is displayed and our redemption was purchased. So I can do no better in this context than offer you comfort and hope as I read God's very words in Romans 8, 18 through 38. Just marvel with me. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait, with, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he also not with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, etc., can separate us from the love of God. Suffering for the Christian does not signal an absence of God. Sleeplessness and so many other sufferings feel overwhelming, but this puts it, the cross puts it in perspective. It can only last this life. And these slight momentary afflictions, every one of them ordained by God, nothing can reach his beloved apart without going through him first, we learned. Every one of these is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So we get our minds off the things that are unseen and look to the things that are seen. The things that are seen 
are transient. The things that are unseen are eternal. And they put the things that we see in glorious perspective. The night without sleep will overwhelm me at night. A life without sleep is brutally hard. But in 10,000 years, when we look back and we see what Christ was accomplishing for us in that, and we get to experience it, we get to look back with these new redeemed bodies, it will seem light and momentary and worth it. So first and most in your suffering and your sleeplessness, look to God in trust and faith. We will not find ultimate satisfaction in this under the sun world. And while sleep is a good gift from God, which he gives to his beloved, yet in love, God often withholds good things in this life from his children for his good purposes. We might get a glimpse into these purposes. We might not. But God's ways are perfect, and we know that for his children, among God's myriad purposes, that in suffering, our sanctification, our holiness, is at least included in those. So most sleeplessness, like that, that of a new parent, or taking midnight, uh, like if, if you work overnight, taking night shift for a season, or if you're a pastor, you get that call at midnight when you really need a full night of sleep food poisoning, or anything else that will keep you awake for the night, you know that it's not going to last that long. So if new moms, seek perspective, talk to old moms. It feels like it won't end. It will. But you know what? That's not our hope. Our hope isn't that it's not going to last forever. Because for some, it might last your whole life. We don't take comfort from the fact that it can't last that long. That, that kind of comfort the world takes. We take comfort primarily in the fact that God means it for our good and his glory. So count suffering. And in this context, the suffering of sleeplessness, all joy. Because if you are God's child and God is giving you sleeplessness, you can rest assured that he is providing something even better for you than a full night's sleep. We know that among the things he is providing, he is providing the testing of your faith that will produce endurance, that leads to a maturity and holiness, a maturity and holiness without which nobody will see the Lord. And we want to know the Lord. We want what he wants. And he saved us so that we would be holy. James 1, 2 through 4, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, a night of sleeplessness, much more a life of chronic sleeplessness would qualify. For you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance or steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, joy is not spontaneous or the natural result of a trial. To have joy in the morning after a night of tossing and turning requires a supernatural perspective. And you and I can be joyful when we get what we prize most in the perspective of God's word, where we know that through our trials, we are actually obtaining full maturity, we're, we're being transformed into what God saved us to be, that's the kind of perspective that can give us joy in trial. In the difficulty of your sleeplessness, if you respond by faith, God is providing you something more valuable, more desirable than sleep, sanctification. And in that purpose, we can and we must find joy even in our sleeplessness. And so don't use sleeplessness as an excuse for sin, but as an opportunity for growth. 
It's been experimentally shown how a single night of less than four hours of sleep can render our reflexes as impaired as being legally drunk. Also, we've learned that when we don't sleep well, the normal connections between the amygdala and prefrontal frontal cortex are compromised. I don't know if you remember, we went into this in the second week. The amygdala can be thought of as the emotional response center. This region is active when you're being driven by emotions. It goes into full alert if you're about to step on a snake, slammed on your brakes because you're in a car accident, or you're facing mortal danger. It's active when your emotions are driving you, and especially ones like fear, anxiety, or anger. The prefrontal cortex up in the front, and on the other hand, it's the region of your brain responsible for higher order executive thoughts, uh, moderating your fears with rational thought, planning, behavioral, behavioral control. The amygdala is like the gas and the prefrontal cortex like the brake and the steering wheel. You, you need both to make the car go. Uh, one without the other is dangerous. And so when we don't sleep well, either acutely or chronically, those regions uh, don't communicate as they ought. And so you can imagine with these regions disconnected, emotions having inordinate control, sinful thinking that was present in your heart will be more prone to be uncovered. You cannot blame sleeplessness for your sin, but you ought to expect that when you are underslept, the sin that flows from your heart will be more readily seen, more readily expressed. So sleeplessness provides an opportunity to assess your heart. You know that when you're underslept, you're going to anticipate that you should keep a close eye out for sin. I find myself more prone to anxiety, more prone to anger, more prone to lack of self-control, more prone to despair and joylessness when I have not slept. You're probably the same. All of these are sins, and I must confess them as such. They cannot be blamed on sleeplessness, but sleeplessness can help reveal what was present in my heart. And so when you see these things, we must immediately forsake them in dependence on the Lord. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So like the hot flame of a furnace burns away impurities from precious metals that maybe weren't seen so the trials of sleeplessness can reveal and by God's grace sanctify us from the pernicious power and presence of indwelling sin. For me, lack of sleeplessness often reveals a lack of contentment in God and his provisions. I'm satisfied in God's provision when he gives me what I want, but an interruption to my planned night's sleep can often be immediately felt, met with a grumbling heart. I must confess this and repent and pursue contentment. When I'm underslept, I'm more prone, you probably are too, to make provision for your flesh, whether it be through gluttony, lack of exercise, or lustful thoughts. No excuse, but be aware that you're more prone to these things and make extra provision to fight them, extra aware that they will likely um, show their head. All of us need to heed the wise command of James 5.16. That command is offered in the context of a proneness to fall into sin when we are most weary. James 5.16 says, Therefore, Confess our sins to one another, your sins to one another, and pray for one another so that you may be healed. It's beyond the scope of this lesson, but know that the healing spoken of in James 5.16 is much more than the physical, but it gets to the healing of the heart that's deadened by the effects of sin. It's particularly in the context of weariness. One of the greatest guards from sin taking over your life when you're weary is the one another's. 
we should always be confessing our sins to one another and praying for one another. But if you find yourself in a season of lack of sleep where you're going to be more prone to the sins that go along with weariness, all the much more make diligent effort to put yourselves in people's lives, praying with one another, praying for one another, and confessing sins. Don't miss out on that important means of grace. Sleep reminds us of our dependence and God's powerful, sustaining provision. Right? We have an opportunity each night, we learn, to demonstrate our need and to experience God's faithfulness when we sleep. How much more do we have an opportunity to depend on God when he responds by withholding sleep? When we don't get the sleep we need, we are still getting exactly the sleep that God has provided. We have an opportunity in this to shepherd our heart away from discontentedness and towards contentment and dependence on God. This contented dependence on Christ in hardship is the context of Paul's declaration in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Even be content when I don't get the sleep I need. What a demonstration of our neediness and weakness sleep reveals, or sleeplessness reveals. And if God sees fit to withhold sleep from his child, rendering you more aware of your physical neediness, you know that in your dependence, he will provide the grace that you need to accomplish the good works that he has given you for the day. You and I can listen to Jesus' words to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where Jesus says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then in response, we can proclaim Paul's words to our own heart in the watching world. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, which we know are exacerbated and demonstrated clearly when you don't sleep, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, like not sleeping, persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul lists in the previous chapter sleeplessness among the trials which he had to endure as an apostle of Christ. Sleeplessness may reveal sin. It may not. It may just be the situation that God has put you in. And sleep can, or your response to sleeplessness can reveal God's spirit at work in you, right? We've said when you see, when sleeplessness reveals sin, immediately confess it, repent, turn from it. But Christian, you are likely responding at at times to sleeplessness with a response that is only possible because you have the Holy Spirit in your heart. When you respond to sleeplessness with joy, when you respond to sleeplessness with contentment, with diligence to go about the good works that God prepared for you that day, when you do that, you are only doing that because you've been supernaturally enabled to do so. Don't miss the chance to give God thanks and to worship him for that work in you. When, there's, when sleeplessness reveals sin, confess it. When it reveals God at work in you, that doesn't point to you. That shows God at work. Give him the glory and the praise. So sleeplessness is an opportunity to assess your heart. So when, when uh, confessing and repenting of sin and giving God glory, the reality of being more prone to sin, to being more prone to having emotions unrestrained, and thereby having opportunity to repent or demonstrate God's supernatural enabling is certainly not a reason to purposefully or unnecessarily allow or pursue sleeplessness, right? All is not lost when you don't sleep, but that doesn't mean that that should be the normal state of things in your life. 
John Piper's observation on his own life and the hindrance on his spiritual resilience when he doesn't sleep is helpful. I'll read it. He writes, I am emotionally less resilient when I lose sleep. And he's speaking to pastors in the long run, uh, planning for uh, endurance in the ministry. And he says, for me, adequate sleep is not a matter of staying healthy. It is a matter of staying in the ministry. It is irrational that my future should look bleaker when I get four or five hours of sleep several nights in a row. But that's irrelevant. Those are the facts. And I must live within the limits of facts. I commend sufficient sleep to you for the sake of your proper assessment of God and his promises. What's he saying? He's expressing the reality of what I said we all experience when our amygdala and prefrontal cortex get disconnected. Physiologically, there's something happening. And what it does is it makes us more prone to weariness, more prone to, or less prone to see the power of God's promises and be sustained by those. It is foolish of us to think I'm going to accomplish more by foregoing sleep um, because the results, especially in minutes, oh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not doing anxious toil. I'm not like the world. I'm foregoing sleep for good things like ministry. There's times when that needs to happen, but that cannot be the norm. When you do that, you're setting yourself up to be more susceptible uh, to sin, um, less self-controlled, and I think Piper's admonishment and encouragement is accurate. So for this reason, we ought to do what we can to help us fall asleep sooner and sleep more efficiently and effectively as we head towards bed. So we, we could spend an entire session. I've been asked, please, please help me know what to do when I can't sleep. Help me know how to sleep better. We could spend an entire session. We could spend probably two or three sessions on good sleep hygiene and suggestions. That, that's not my specialty. I've by, God, by God's grace, I've learned a lot about sleep and how to do it better, um, especially facing difficulties post-chemo and having a wife who's, see, who, due to back pain, has chronic sleeplessness. This is a topic that's near and dear to my own heart, and I've learned a ton about, but that's not the point of this lesson. That's not the primary intent of this series, but I, I do think it would be appropriate to spend a a few minutes just giving you an idea of some of the practical things that you could do to be more efficient and effective as you pursue sleep. So first, I would just encourage you, don't miss the opportunity to pray. I know that sounds obvious. Oh yeah, of course. But how often do you enter a night of sleeplessness so worried that you aren't going to get it, or especially when you can't get sleep every night and you're not praying for it. Pray for your night's sleep throughout the day. Pray that you would trust God regardless of what he brings. Uh, don't miss the chance to express dependence of God, not only as you sleep, but as you approach sleep. Sleep is a good gift from God, not necessarily something that just naturally happens. It's given. Prepare for sleep before sleep. Do things like a routine. Go to bed um, as, as you head towards bed. This is something I do. It's, this, these are not commands from the Lord. These are just merely observations that sleep scientists have shared and I found particularly helpful. If you know you're going to bed at 8, 9, 10 o'clock, two or three hours in advance of that, get yourself and your family ready for sleep. You can't run full steam, say, all right, bedtime, and then flip a switch. Sleep doesn't work like that. So do routines. What we do is, as the sun goes down, usually right, and right around six, we dim the lights, flip a large amount of them off, and we're careful not to turn them on. When we turn them on, turn the light in the other room on so you can see, but so that you're not blazing bright. There's two things that drive sleep primarily. We learned about the first one, I think the first week, adenosine, which is the thing that gives you sleep pressure 
the thing I'm taking the antidote for right now, that's caffeine blocks adenosine. And throughout the day, adenosine builds, giving you that sleep pressure. And you have this other thing, melatonin, that goes with your cycles of, of awake and sleep. And things like bright light and activity can artificially suppress that melatonin rise. Also, a late nap can do the same. Coffee can do the same. So don't do things like full blast, awake, bright lights all the way up through bedtime. Cut off caffeine intake early. Caffeine has a half-life, and it's variable in most people. Half-life just means the time of that it takes for half of it to be present in your bloodstream. So if you chug two cups of coffee eight hours before bedtime, that means at bedtime, most people will still have one cup of coffee circulating through their blood. If you, it's variable. Some people process it a lot faster, two to four hours. Some people are even longer. But be aware of the effects of caffeine. If you use it, cut it off earlier. For me, I, I can't drink caffeine uh, and sleep well after noon. That was significantly different earlier in my life. For some, it might even be something that you have to avoid. So we said routine, turn lights off, decrease stimulation, maybe a screen curfew. Uh, screens, there may be some effect through like your iPhone, your smartphone, your iPad, TV screens of blue light, dropping melatonin. Scientifically, that, that doesn't seem to be bearing itself out. I think it's more the stimulation that those things provide. Um, like I said, you just don't do well going from stimulation to rest. So in in the pursuit of sleep, do something like a, a screen curfew of those messages constantly coming in, emails, barrage of, of notifications, or just entertainment that gets your adrenaline going. Shut that down. Instead, do something like calm reading or calm activity discussions as a family, something that's not stimulating, that, that's part of a daily routine heading towards sleep. Pursue a consistent sleep window. Your body and its cycles are, it's not like you can just go to sleep on demand, but it is a physiologic process driven by chemicals and hormones. And those things are designed on a 24 hour cycle that peak at about the same time. So it's not gonna go well if you go to bed nine o'clock, three nights, then midnight, two nights, and expect to go back to, to nine o'clock the other nights, your timing will be all off. There's just like when you fly across the country and your timing is off, you know, you're used to going to bed at eight o'clock each night, then you fly to Hawaii and now you need to go to bed. My, my time off, you're gonna, you're gonna jet lag, right? You know what it is, you, you're going to bed at a different time and then you fly back and you, you can't fall asleep. The same kind of things happens when you go to bed early every day, then on the weekend to try to adjust to a later schedule and then go straight back to an early schedule. That's called social jet lag. That's why Monday morning, you often have a hard time falling asleep Sunday night, waking up Monday morning. Just a good practical thing. Go to bed at the same time. Um, exercise is very helpful in helping you fall asleep just not close to bedtime. Tends to keep your heart rate up. That deep sleep, which happens early in the night cycle, we talked about your deep sleep heavy early, that doesn't do well when your heart rate is up and your cortisol is up. You tend to be more um, cortisol sensitive when lower, lower numbers when you exercise regularly. Um, so do it early in the day, do it regularly, cut it off. Uh, close to bedtime if you have a hard time sleeping. Similarly, food. Food eaten late at night, especially in large doses, keeps your heart rate up and you tend to not fall asleep early. And if you do, it's poor quality. Alcohol completely obliterates uh, for many uh, deep sleep. It, you can fall asleep, but you're in light ranges. And uh, Many sleeping pills do the same thing. You may find yourself unconscious, but you don't cycle through those, those sleep cycles as normal. So be aware of things that you might be doing, whether it's sleeping aids, even a, a glass of, of wine if you do that at dinner could completely mess up sleep. Post-cancer for me, when I, if I have even a single glass of wine with 
it, I, my deep sleep is, is affected for like three or four days um, by aura ring tracking. It's nuts. I'm not, that's just me. Everybody's different, but be very aware that the things that you do might be negatively affecting your sleep. Things like temperature that you might not be aware of. Falling asleep, deep sleep is triggered in, physiologically by a drop in temperature in your body. Ways that you can help this happen if you have a hard time falling asleep. This is for people who are like, I just can't fall asleep, help me. Try taking a, a really warm shower right before bed. What that does is it opens up all the capillaries in your periphery. Then let your bedroom, if you have the means, be the coldest room in your house. Go lay down right after the hot shower. You're going to have all the blood at the periphery. The cold air sucks the temperature from your body. It just takes like a half degree temperature drop and you trigger sleep. Without that, sleep is harder to come by. Um, if you have the means and you have difficulty sleeping, especially in Arizona, they make things, bed coolers, where you can pump cold water through your bed. Um, sort of cheating, but for me, it really, really helps. Um, if you find yourself awake, lying awake, mind racing, don't just lay there. Get up, go do something in another room that's not stimulating. Fold laundry, um, pray. We're going to hear in a few minutes, meditate on God's word. If you're doing that and you're not sleeping, consider doing that in another room of the house under dim light. And when you feel sleepy, go back. Don't associate your bedroom with lying awake, not sleeping. Um, I can keep going. I need to move on. Uh, just consider if it's helpful for you, if you're that kind of person, sleep trackers to help you know how much sleep you are getting, where you're deficient, and be able to see the effects of, uh, of your sleep, of your practices on your sleep. Uh, Aura Ring is probably standard. Uh, Apple Watch, Fitbit, they make others. Those aren't necessary, but they can be helpful tools. Sorry for taking so much time there. I need to move on. Uh, just like sleeplessness is an opportunity to assess your heart, sleeplessness also provides an opportunity to direct your heart. When you can't sleep, don't let your mind wander, but use it as an opportunity to meditate upon God. Direct your heart towards contentment, trust, and joy. Don't resign yourself to the situation you're in. Don't let yourself have undirected thoughts because undirected sleeplessness often leads to wandering thoughts that can culminate in contemplating the worthless or passing time with awake promoting foolishness like Facebook reels, TikTok, YouTube, email skimming, news articles, or other time wasting foolishness. Don't go there when you can't sleep. Rather, undirect, um, well, I would just say undirected thoughts amidst foolishness can not only lead to foolishness, like foolish wastes of time, but can actually lead itself, even if not rooted in anxiety. Sleeplessness can lead to anxiety if you let your mind wander. Oh, when am I going to fall asleep? Oh, look, it's midnight. It's one. It's two. It's three. I'm never going to get enough sleep. How am I going to go about tomorrow? Anxiety rather than directing your thoughts toward trust in the Lord. Um. The Bible is consistent that we ought to worshipfully meditate upon God in all of life, but especially in our bed and the quiet, vulnerable darkness where our minds may wander. It's a particularly precious time to do so, especially when sleep isn't coming easy. Consider verses like Psalm 16, 7. I bless Yahweh who gives me counsel. In, my, in the night also my heart instructs me. These are on the PowerPoint. By day, Psalm 42, 8, by day, Yahweh commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Psalm 63, 5 through 6, my soul will be satisfied when I remember you upon my, de my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. Psalm 77, 6, when the psalmist can't find sleep, and he's so troubled that he feels his eyelids are being held open by God, like I referred to earlier. He then says, let me remember my song in the night and let me meditate in my heart. And then in his sleeplessness, he goes on to meditate upon the wondrous works of God and shepherd-like care of his God. 
There's more. Uh, Psalm 119, 55. I remember your name in the night, O Yahweh, and keep your law. Psalm 149, 5. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. It is right to meditate on God before you sleep in order to glorify God in your sleep. And if there was ever a reason to wake from your sleep, it would likewise be to meditate upon God and his word. Like Psalm 119, 148 says, my eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. And Psalm 119, 62, at midnight, I rise to praise you. There are times to forego sleep especially if it's an expression of spiritual attentiveness. But that ought not be the norm. Um, We learn that Jesus stayed up through the night in prayer, like Luke 6, 12. In those days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all the night he continued in prayer to God. The psalmist seeking God through his word testifies, like I read earlier, I rise before dawn and cry for help. Verse 62, at midnight, I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. So it's right for times to stay awake. Spiritual inattentiveness is often described in scripture as metaphorical sleeping, like Mark 13, 32 says, But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So be on guard and keep awake. Verse 37, and what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Speaking metaphorically of of be, be attentive, don't be spiritually asleep or inattentive when you ought to be awake and aware. And this translates into real life. Two, the disciples exemplified this spiritual inattentiveness through falling asleep when they ought to have been awake. When Jesus asked them to stay awake with him in the garden and pray, they slept instead. Matthew 26, 40, Jesus said, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. And again, he found them sleeping and their eyes were heavy. So be aware that spiritual inattentiveness can be shown by a tendency to sleep when you ought to be awake. And we reviewed last week the plethora of admonitions, particularly in Proverbs, against being lazy, which is often manifested in sleeping when you ought to be awake. But laziness and spiritual attentiveness often do show themselves through sleeping when you ought to be awake. So you can sleep, sorry, sleep when you're awake, or you you find yourself sleeping when you ought to be awake, but we also find ourselves awake when we ought to be asleep, like Xboxing in the middle of the night, watching TV, staying up, particularly, usually you find yourself doing things that appeal to your flesh, entertainment. It's amazing how fast two hours can go at night through wasted time when it is such brutal work to even grab 20 minutes extra in the morning. Be attentive, be awake, prioritize sleep at the right times for the right reasons. I pray that the effect of this series would be that you and I would indeed sleep more, sleep better, and sleep for the right reasons. And that we don't miss the chance to recognize the opportunity and reminders that we get each night provided to us in sleep. Sleep should be a nightly humbling reminder that God is God and we are creatures. Sleep is a nightly demonstration of our need in God's incomparable faithfulness, power, and strength. Sleep is a nightly opportunity to humbly and dependently trust God. Sleep is a gift from God whereby he works for his beloved while we rest. Sleep and sleeplessness are an opportunity to assess and direct our hearts. And finally, let me leave. I think that's a slide up there. I think we're we're behind on, 
on it. Yeah, I go a few forward. Yeah. And finally, let me leave you with a sixth consideration that for the Christian, sleep each night is a parable of and practice for death. The New Testament's favorite description of death for the Christian is sleep. And when we sleep, we give up our conscious physical control of our body. And in faith, we trust the one who does not sleep or slumber, who will keep us through the night and cause us to awake in the morning. When the Christian dies, it's much the same. We close our eyes and we trust that this is not the end. The same one who day to day sustains us each night when we sleep and then raises our head, David declares in the morning, will raise us up when he returns, but this time imperishable. Each night we must sleep to be renewed in the morning while he works for us. And for those who enter the sleep of death in Christ, we will be renewed and raised to something better. When Jesus comes back, those present won't have to go through this sleep of death to be renewed. But for all of those who die in Christ, we can consider them to just be asleep. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Each night when we go to sleep, we get a chance to look forward to and trust God for providing that day when we're awakened finally from our sleep to our renewed bodies that won't experience that pain of sleeplessness where we get to know God intimately, see him face to face, and sin will be done away with, and we will be renewed, mortality being swallowed up by immortality. For the Christian, sleep is a parable and practice for death. Don't miss this lesson among the many others each night as you fall asleep.